Welcome to today's Nicaragua webinar entitled the ALBA TP TCP, first fair trade agreement in the world and how the US tried to destroy it. We'll hear from the speakers followed by a period for questions and answers. Many thanks to Yoav Elenovsky, who is providing our technical support, and grateful thanks also to our two interpreters, Jill Clark Golub and Magda Lanusa. We also thank our many organizational co-sponsors who are, they will be listed in the chat in a moment. My name is Barbara Larkham, and I'll serve as one of your co-moderators today. We also welcome Stan Smith as the other co-moderator, and you'll hear from him in just a moment. Okay, Stan Smith. Okay, hello, my name is Stan Smith. I'm the other co-moderator today. Before we begin, we have some announcements. We'll, we'll make sure to post all the information and links in the chat as well. Today's event is part of an ongoing monthly series about of Nicaragua. Our next webinar will be held Sunday, July 23rd at the same time as today. It will feature people who have been visited Nicaragua for the celebration of uh, the revolution on July 19th. And they will share why they believe Nicaragua is important in today's world. If you'd like to become more active in supporting the Nicaragua's sovereignty and opposing foreign interference in the country, please join our International Solidarity Coalition. You can check the website uh, regularly at nicaraguanicasolidarity.net. And please put your name and email in the Q&A if you'd like to receive action alerts our, our weekly newsletter and our monthly meeting notices. Our next coalition meeting will be on Monday, July 10th. To save as much time as possible for this program, we'll enter some of the other information in the chat about other ways that you can get involved and learn more about Nicaragua. <clears throat> and now we'll turn to our featured speakers. Uh, the first, uh, Hector Igarza Cabrera is Cuba's ambassador to Canada. And it's Stan. Yes. Uh, we're doing the Nicaraguan first. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, he's been the Cuba's ambassador to Canada since uh, June 2022. Previously, he was a director of the North Africa, Northern Africa and Middle East Department at the Cuban Foreign Ministry. And I would like to publicly thank Arnold August for his help in securing the ambassador as a speaker. Jesus Bermudez is Nicaragua's Minister of Commerce, and he is Nicaragua's top official managing the ALBA TCP portfolio. Carlos Ron, who is a friend of many in the movement in North America, is Venezuela's Deputy, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for North America. Previously, he was a minister counselor in the embassy of Venezuela in Washington, DC until the US government expelled the diplomats and shut down the embassy. So we will start by asking each of you uh, to answer a question, um, starting with Jesus Bermudez. The follow, to answer the following questions briefly in about five minutes. What is the ALBA TCP? How has your country benefited from the agreement? And how do you think the participating countries have generally benefited? So I'll turn it over to the Minister Bermudez now. Thank you very much and a very good afternoon to everyone, compañeros and compañeras. Sandinista greetings from Nicaragua and greetings from Comandante Daniel Ortega and Compañera Rosario Murillo from the land of Sandino and Rendario. Also a very warm embrace to our uh, brothers and sisters in our sister republics of Cuba and Venezuela. First, we're going to talk about how Nicaragua benefited from the ALBA agreement. I will be very brief and direct. 
correct. First of all, in 2007, Nicaragua became part of the ALBA bloc of countries that wanted a change in the international context and production, trade, and the well-being of our peoples, based on solidarity, complementarity, cooperation, and special and differentiated treated treatment for small economies. And this uh, shook the floor under the feet of imperialism. This trade agreement with Venezuela led us to export $2 billion in 2006 to $445 million in 2012. The previous figure was in millions. And making uh, Venezuela our third leading trading partner. We stopped having 12-hour energy blackouts. And this had to do with national production and the Nicaraguan people. Uh, thanks to the donation of generating plants by Comandante Hugo Chavez, this was one of the main symbols of solidarity that we received from ALBA. That act on the part of uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, Comandante Hugo Chavez, 2007. We also uh, complemented this with part, uh, we paid with uh, grains. Uh, to, to the Petro Caribbean company. We saw how we could benefit with cooperatives and we started our entrepreneurship and new uh, small and medium enterprises. And this improved health, education, sewer, water, and uh, road services in our country. We also began to build a refinery and the, the Sueño de Bolivar uh, refinery complex. And we built a whole series of national businesses of different types that allowed us to have a very marked influence on the national uh, market for the success of the ALBA programs. I believe that the major difference between this fair trade agreement of the peoples, ALBA, and conventional trade agreements that are normally negotiated is precisely the lack of personal interest, but rather interest in increasing production and the well-being of our peoples. This was an agreement to build res uh, resources to improve the lives of our people. And this is precisely the main objective of this ALBA TCP. And that is precisely what uh, US imperialism did not want, progress for the poorest of the poor. I believe that that is the main characteristic of the ALBA agreement. I will stop there in answer to the first question. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, okay, Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, second, Minister, we'll hear from the Cuban ambassador to Canada, Igarza Cabrera. Igarza Cabrera. Yes. I, I think uh, that uh, we should put uh, the ALBA in the right place where it, sh it should be. We have to remember that uh, Cuba did host last year on December uh, 14th, the 22nd summit of head of state and government of ALBA. During this uh, meeting, uh, it was held in a very complicated uh, regional scenario and in a very increasingly, increasingly tense and complex international situation. There are, in ALBA, as you know, ALBA. Uh, there are 10 different countries, but uh, with uh, constant aspirations in the effort to complement and, and seek what unites them beyond the difference that we normally we, uh, we have. Faced uh, with that uh, common challenge, the 22nd summit reaffirms this project funded 18 years ago by commanders Fidel that was uh, committed to integration, solidarity, peace, and unity of the peoples of the continent. If we want to have an idea of what, what is uh, ALBA, we should uh, look at the benefit that all countries are uh, getting from this uh, organization. First of all, Oh, 
parece que hay alguna interrupción. There is an interruption. Hello. Hello. Hello? Well, maybe you could, it's over. Maybe you could Hello? try, continue. Hello? Yes? Is, ah, uh, yes, Do you, you can continue speaking. Ambassador. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So during uh, these uh, 18 years of uh, ALBA, all countries, our 10 countries have uh, benefited of many accomplishments. For example, we had 4,989,000 literate people together with ALFA three Latin American countries were declared territories free of illiteracy. That were Venezuela, Bolivia, and Nicaragua. The miracle mission has restored the site for free to more than 6 million people. As part of the psychological, psychosocial genetic clinical study of people with disabilities, unprotected people were identified in six of the ALBA countries. Millions of consultations have been offered. Thousands of young people from Latin America, the Caribbean and Africa have been trained as doctors with a deep social vocation of high education, technical, ethical, and human humanistic preparation at the Latin American School of Medicine with offices in Cuba and Venezuela. Several editions of Alba Sports Games have been held with the participation of more than 10,000 athletes. In 2005, Fidel and Chavez created Petro Caribe, an oil alliance between some Caribbean countries and Venezuela. Alba has articulated as a bloc the provision of humanitarian aid to several countries in the region, such as Haiti, on the occasion of the earthquake that occurred on January 12, 2010. These are some few uh, examples of what ALBA, ALBA has been doing, but especially ALBA has been very useful in order to face the sanctions applied by United States, especially against Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. This uh, platform is a model of cooperation between the countries that are affected by the sanctions that unilaterally are applied by the government of the United States. So it has been during these uh, uh, years, 18 years, a very useful way of cooperation, of cooperation. And I think that in the future, if we have to triumph, we have to look for the victory of our internationalism and solidarity. We have to improve the work of the, the, the ALBA. Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, and the other seven countries must go united, must follow being united, especially in times of sanctions. And for the people of Nicaragua, they know that Cuba has always been solidarity with its people and that our commitment is to keep doing the same as long as it takes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Um, yes, I should uh, note uh, that Cuba has also helped uh, train uh, between 200 and 300 doctors from the United States for free. Uh, exactly. 
And just like I can remember years ago, how Venezuela sent oil for the poor communities in the United States for, for free to help them pay their heating bills. Well, I'll turn to Carlos Ron now, if you could talk about the Alba. Well, first of all, let me thank everyone for the invitation and, and, and of course extend my, my greetings to Ministro Bermuda, Embajador Igarza. Uh, let me let me just say I, I, I want to reiterate uh, what both the minister and the ambassador have, have said, of course. Um, and I think we should look at ALBA TCP uh, as re a real breakthrough in what our continent, uh, you know, was thought about in relation to integration. There's a real change of of a paradigm when ALBA comes into, into effect by uh, the, the, of course, the ideas of, of uh, Comandantes Chavez and, and Fidel. Here uh, with, with ALBA, we really depart the idea that the only type of integration that is useful for our region is a commercial integration, is that uh, in the integration of the, uh, um, of the, free trade agreement uh, of, the, of the time, uh, ALBA really breaks with that model and says, look, we can really strengthen our union as a region based on other principles, like uh, Mr. Bermudez mentioned, complement, complementation, complementarity among, amongst our, our countries, solidarity, uh, justice as being one guiding principles, cooperation. This is very important. See, we, we can give you we can give numbers and figures, uh, and and that is of course is is uh, fundamental and important because it, it helps us show uh, how the impact uh, you know in our policies have have been uh, important for us. But honestly, there is no comparison of the benefit of something like uh, getting rid of illiteracy the impact that that has on the population, the impact that that has on everyday lives is just, is, is much more than a number. It's much more than saying one person overcame literacy. It's a whole transformation of a person's life in the same way that many people uh, through the Barrio Adentro model here in Venezuela, a product of the cooperation under ALBA between Cuba and Venezuela for the first time had access to, to, to a doctor and had access, many people in our low income uh, communities that had been traditionally excluded for the first time were able to be taken care of by doctors. This is, this is, this is uh, amazing. And, and, you know, I, I can't stress enough how important this is in a transformation of people's lives. ALBA is, a, is, a, is part of a, a unity program, not just integration, but unity where countries put their resources together for the benefit and the common benefit of all. And that the, and that the result is a more dignified living for their peoples. And this, again, is not to be understood. And this is important that, that, that we share this with our friends in the United States. It's never been unity against anyone, against uh, uh, any other country, but rather it's a unity in which we seek to establish stronger relationships between countries that are uh, on equal terms, that respect each other, that respect international law, and that and that see uh, the role as something, uh, you know, the role as not a, a dominance between uh, countries, but rather cooperation, so that we all can achieve a better life. The, the trade agreement, the model of free trade that was uh, at one point uh, promoted by uh, the FTAA uh, in, in the United States, that those models of neoliberalism were basically models that repeated dependence and exploitation of our countries. ALBA is a different principle. ALBA is cooperation. ALBA is uh, mutual gains. And ALBA is really a hope for the rest uh, of Latin America. I think it has served many times as, as a political uh, unit 
that has pushed uh, forward uh, processes of inclusion and of social transformation, and that has served as an example uh, for all of our region. So it's really, it, it really has no comparison with the neoliberal type of uh, integration, but rather it's something new that we think is, is important in a, in a world of today where we think that there are so many threats and so many challenges that we all face together. Thank you to all three of our speakers uh, for that uh, very interesting introduction. And so now we're uh, going to be going to a second set of, of questions about the ALBA uh, TCP. One moment while I get to these questions. Okay, and now we will ask each speaker in, in the same order to do a longer response, but no more than 15 minutes each to a related set of questions. Uh, and actually, I'll ask then the Nicaraguan uh, speaker to go first. I will let each of you know when you have two minutes left for your response. Here are the questions. How have coercive measures imposed by the United States or its allies affected how the ALBA TCP agreement functions? And by coercive measures, we mean sanctions or embargo or blockade or similar measures. And what are the effects of those coer coercive measures on the people in your country? So first we'll hear from uh, Minister Jesus Bermudez of uh, Nicaragua. Thank you very much. The entire beneficial situation that I uh, set forth in answer to the first question was changing in 2013 in a very negative way due to the sanctions that U.S. imperialism was imposing on our government without even mentioning the blockade on Cuba, which is so longstanding and has grown much harsher in recent years. We must clarify that all of these coercive sanctions or measures imposed by the United States are completely in complete violation of international law. There is no justification under international law for any of the sanctions that the United States is imposing against our countries. First of all, I can tell you that our trade with Venezuela, which was the largest volume of trade that we had at that time, dropped in 2022 to $27 million. In other words, 2012, it was uh, the, uh, 444 million, and last year it dropped down to 20, just $27 million in 2014. Also, a trade agreement with Cuba, uh, a trade agreement with Cuba came into effect that we negotiated under ALBA, but it couldn't go into effect due to the problems with paying um, trade transactions because of the blockade and sanctions on Cuba. At present, we export $6.8 million to Cuba and we import $1 million. That is had a tremendous impact on our uh, trade with Cuba. Currently, our exports to all of the ALBA countries are a little bit more than $36 million and our imports are only $2.4 million. With the countries that we have the highest level of trade are Venezuela, Cuba, Bolivia, uh, within this restricted uh, trade the system that I mentioned. They also suspended investment in large projects such as the Sueño de Bolivar in our petrochemical uh, sector. We are currently oil dependent and we continue to, this continues to be a very important project for Nicaragua because we were going to construct an oil refinery and an industrial uh, complex for uh, oil byproducts. For us, all of these uh, petroleum byproducts were going to be extremely important important for our agriculture. They also, we also had to suspend investment in significant projects such as the Petro Caribe program. Our government had to set aside, had, wait for a better fiscal situation in order to collect taxes and be able to pay for uh, social programs. 40% of oil um, invoices were uh, allocated to social programs. Also, we began to join the uh, 
the Aladi uh, system, which allowed us to have uh, trade with, it also facilitated work with uh, ALBA countries because they're also members of Aladi and we had specific trade relations within the ALBA. I wish I clarify that within ALBA, what we currently have are framework agreements, but there is no specific agreement that allows us to have bilateral trade with under the principles and terms negotiated by ALBA TCP. We have not been able to achieve that yet. Therefore, we have been trying through Aladi to create this uh, legal structure with each country so that we could have that bilateral trade. However, we have found that there is resistance from Paraguay. We, within that framework, in 2012, we were negotiating this within Alave from 2012, and we've been able to negotiate something with other countries, but the neoliberal government of Paraguay has opposed these negotiations because they have not allowed us to negotiate with them and thus conclude the negotiations, which is very important for us to be able to trade with the um, ALBA countries, nor has Nicaragua been able to conclude negotiations with Colombia or Peru, uh, which is about 80% of the way there. In both of these cases, it is because these countries have refused to resume negotiations, but that doesn't matter. We are now negotiating a free trade agreement with China, which will double the number of consumers that we can sell our products to and will make this ally of ours our main uh, investor even uh, replacing or displacing the United States. You may recall that the current biggest trade partner with Nicaragua is the United States, more than 3.7. In other words, 66% of our exports go to the United States. We are fully dependent on the United States, but the agreement with China will allow us to break free of that uh, dependence in the medium and long term. Therefore, the agreement with China is extremely important. We're about 80% of it has been negotiated. We ex expect to conclude it in August and put it into effect next year. Also, the United States has applied sanctions to prevent Nicaragua Nicaragua from in increasing its um, a sugar quota under the WTO, but currently we are selling our sugar and we're not affected by this with these other agreements. In other words, my remarks are talking about how we have been harmed or prejudiced by the sanctions in terms of Nicaragua's trade and also in terms of social uh, area because all of our social projects, although none of them have stopped, none of the social proje projects have stopped, the government of Nicaragua has had found the ways to can move forward with these social programs and they have continued and even improved. The major advantage that Nicaragua has is that we have a resilient economy. It's very strong because we are an agricultural country and our, our food products are in demand around the world. That has helped us a lot. In addition, we have a very wide leadership under uh, Comandante Ortega and Compañero Rosario Muria. They've taken very wise decisions so that our country can continue to move forward despite the sanctions. That's where we are, and we're going to keep working on this, brothers and sisters, and we'll continue to harvest victory with our brothers and sisters in Cuba and Venezuela and all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Bermudez. And uh, now we will turn to the, uh, the ambassador from Cuba uh, to Canada. Uh, one okay. more. Thank you. Thank you very much. My, my name is Hector Igerza. Yes, uh, you know, the, the combined effects of multidimensional crisis at a global level in the energy food, environmental, and transportation sectors, and the accumulated impact of two years of the COVID-19 pandemic have shaped a complex international context. Inserted in this reality, Cuba has had to face, on top of that, the unprecedented tightening of the US blockade, which includes additional very aggressive measures imposed during the administration of Donald Trump and which, for the most part, are still enforced 
as a continuation of the policy of maximum pressure against our country. Since uh, 2018, the blockade has escalated to a qualita qualitatively more harmful and inhuman dimension with a reinforced extraterritorial component. The lawsuit filed under Title III of the Helsburton Act, the persecution of companies, chips, and shipping companies that send fuel supplies to the country, the arbitrary and unjustified inclusion of Cuba on the State Department's list of state sponsors of terrorism, the attack on all sources of income and foreign currency entering the country, the intimidation of third parties and the reinforcement of pressure on the governments, banking institutions, and businessmen around the world have been consolidated as an essential part of the US strategy to isolate Cuba and provoke economic disruption. The continued full application of the Harris Burton Act, including the authorization to file lawsuits in the US courts under its Title III, further expanded the scheme to hinder Cuba's economic, commercial, and financial relations with third countries. As of the end of July 2022, 13 lawsuits were pending in US courts under this extraterritorial law. Cuba's permanence on the list of state sponsors of terrorism has reinforced the deterrent and intimidating impact of the blockade, as well as the country's difficulties in engaging in international trade and financial operations. This has resulted in the closing of contracts, loss of relations with banking entities that usually worked with Cuba, in-depthness, delays in the sending and receiving of funds and goods, among other difficulties, with a lot of cost and consequences for the Cuban people and our economy. Under conditions of a true economic war, the US government has unleashed a pernicious media campaign in an attempt to destabilize the country. They resort to lies, slander, manipulation of data, images, and the most diverse methods of unconventional warfare to generate political destabilization and the so-called regime change in clear violation of the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of states. As you know, the American blockade that was imposed officially in 1962 has been in place for more these years. And since 1992, every year, the General Assembly of the United Nations have rejected by most of the international community these uh, sanctions. And since then, only two countries, only two countries in the international community are supporting these sanctions. It's the United States, of course, and it's uh, ally Israel. The rest of the international community has been voting for the last 30 years, every year against these uh, uh, sanctions. We are feeling that our situation is very difficult. Our people is suffering, it is true, but we can assure you that our principles have been very solid and our people is decided and committed to face these uh, sanctions and to be sure that we are going to triumph, we are going to have the victory at the end of the road. The United States are the only one who are isolated. Cuba is counting with the solidarity of the international community. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And so finally, then we turn to our speaker from Venezuela, um, Deputy uh, Minister uh, Carlos Ron. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, a few days ago, uh, when former President uh, Donald Trump was going to, was coming out of the session, the hearing with uh, um, courts, in 
Florida. He stopped uh, and 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 said in in a rally, apparently some sort of campaign event. He mentioned you know uh, uh, Venezuela, and he said that his intention, uh, you know, when he was in in power, uh, had been to make Venezuela collapse, and that if if that had taken place, not only would Venezuela have collapsed, but uh, he would have been able to get his hands on our oil and the US would now have all that oil for itself. This mentality uh, of trying to uh, take over the resources uh, of, our, of our countries is, is I think the origin, the real origin of the you know, lateral coercive measures against Venezuela. But I think there's also an important issue is that agreements such as ALBA uh, and policies such as the ones that the revolutionary governments such as the ones in Cuba and Nicaragua have put into place are also a source of, of concern, of worry to the US because this, this is the proof that a socialist model can be effective in doing specifically what the capitalist model cannot do. The capitalist model in the United States, for example, uh, uh, cannot claim to have uh, overcome poverty, have not, cannot claim to have overcome literacy, cannot claim to have uh, massively covered uh, you know, uh, uh, healthcare uh, problems. So what the unilateral coercive measures do or, or are, are aiming to do in our countries is specifically hurt those things that we were able to consolidate under socialist policies. In the case of Venezuela in particular, uh, locking Venezuela's possibility of, of using its main uh, resource, or main source of income, which is oil, uh, affects not only uh, you know, the, the, the state and the, the structure of the state, which is, which is finances, but it, it also, it, the measures have also blocked the, the possibility of uh, providing Everything from food that we that we used to import, medicines or supplies, medical supplies that we used to need uh, as well, uh, as as and also things such as uh, spare parts uh, for uh, companies that, for example, the the water company, the electrical company, all these all these companies are, are, you know were built on U.S. or or, or foreign uh, companies. Uh, under material. So these companies can't, because of the sanctions, they can't come and uh, give us spare parts or update or do maintenance on the equipment. So that ends up hurting the way we provide public services for the population. Again, it's, it's all aimed at destroying the model that we, that was successfully uh, carrying out, uh, you know, development and, and progress uh, for us. That's not to say they are achieved in destroying that model. As a matter of fact, we, it, it, may, it has made us more creative. We have had to find other ways and other allies. And, and, you know, and again, the, the principle of cooperation and collaboration was, was uh, essential for us to uh, face challenges. During the pandemic, for example, Venezuela was blocked in a way that we had enough money at the beginning of the, uh, of, of the pandemic in our bank accounts in, in other countries so that we, would, we could purchase enough vaccines to vaccinate the whole population uh, uh, you know, from, from the start. However, those assets belonging to the Venezuelan people were frozen by the US measures. And if it were not for the solidarity of Cuba, which their vaccine, which again, we have to think of, of, about how amazing and heroic it is that, uh, that the people of Cuba, despite the blockade against them, were able to develop this, this uh, remarkable scientific uh, uh, product of, of vaccines in Cuba. Well, if it was not for the solidarity of Cuba and other countries such as Russia and China that helped Venezuela obtain vaccines, we would still be waiting for you know, uh, the possibility of, of even purchasing having the money, but being that money being frozen, 
who still need that help to purchase vaccines for our population. And the results would have been probably catastrophic uh, during the pandemic. This is, this, this is to point out that sanctions are criminal. These sanctions amount to collective punishment. This is a crime against humanity as, uh, as is uh, recorded under international law. And, and again, the idea is that under this pressure that is placed on our countries, we would change our form of government, we would change our policies, uh, we would even you know, overthrow our leaders. That, that's the real aim uh, so that they, people like Trump can come and say, now we can take over uh, Venezuelan oil and Venezuelan resources. You know, I think it is important that uh, that we see uh, that it is the principles of cooperation and solidarity that that really can defeat uh, this type of aggression. Is is what has helped us stay strong. But the affect, the affectation is not little. The affectation has been very strong. Venezuela not being able to provide uh, energy. Uh, through oil exports, as it used to before, has definitely hurt uh, uh, other countries in the whole Caribbean and Central American region, as we see, uh, you know, from the testimonies of our of our ambassador and, and, and our and our minister from from sisters uh, Nicaragua and Cuba. You know, it it is it is true that it it has made things more unstable, and it's funny that the United States uh, now. Uh, would would say that you know they there's a there's threats or there's uh, uh, problems come stemming out from migration, when precisely the the use of sanctions that exacerbate economic problems in our region also serve as an incentive for for people to migrate. So in a sense, promoting the instability of countries such as Venezuela attacking programs that will that help stabilize the economies of the region of the Caribbean like Petro Caribe are actually contributing to precisely what uh, apparently US lawmakers don't want which is you know further increase in uh, in migration see this is a vicious circle that is aimed again at uh, you know goals that were drawn uh, from you know, the Cold War mentality, and not uh, from you know a reasonable uh, relation that the United States should have with the rest of the region. I think it is important that people in the United States, uh, you know, realize that it would be very different if their government would be doing something to promote understanding, respect, uh, mutual cooperation rather than place uh, this uh, aggression over our, our peoples. Venezuela, and, and with this I, I finish, Venezuela has lost uh, about you know, $232 billion in lost income since that maximum campaign pressure from Trump. Uh, over 930 measures have been issued against us. You know, everything from not only the sanctions themselves, but over compliance as well, because see, the the sanctions regime is is basically a terror regime uh, uh, towards everyone involved. Companies that you know feel they don't want to sell food or medicine to our countries because they fear retaliation in the United States with their business. So it becomes a, you know a, this this whole scheme of of terrorism. Uh, really against our peoples in our country. Thank you. Yes, uh, if you have, uh, if you give me two or three minutes more, please. Yes, please. Yes, uh, normally when uh, people and the press and media talk about the end of the Cold War, I always remember my counterparts, people I talk to, that maybe for the rest of the world, the, uh, the Cold War is uh, ended, but for us, it's uh, still very hot. For us, I mean Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, um, and Venezuela. For example, between August 2021 and February 2022 alone, the policy of sanctions caused loss to Cuba in the order of 
$1.8 billion, a figure 49% higher than that reported in the previous period. This record amount in just uh, seven months is a reflection of the intensified impact of the blockade on Cuban exports, mainly in the tourism sector. The merciless persecution of the country's banking financial operations, the costs of geographic relocation of trade, the effects on production and services provided to the population, and the obstacles to access advantages advanced technologies. It is estimated that the GDP could have grown 4.5% in those seven months if the blockade had not existed, which projected to one year represents around 8%. Taking into account the damage reported between January, July, 2021, in the first 14 months of joy Biden administration alone, the damages caused by the blockade reached more than $6.3 billion, which represents an impact of more than $454 million a month and more than $15 million per day. This is just to have for you to have an idea of what sanctions mean for the Cuban people. Thank you. Thank you to all three speakers. I think Stan uh, and I will be taking turns posing questions that were in the Q&A to the speakers and Stan is taking the first one. Yeah, okay, thank you, uh, Barbara. Um, there's a question that is about Nicaragua and China, but I would also like to hear the speakers from Cuba and Venezuela address the same questions. It's how will Nicaraguan to China trade agreement change what is produced in Nicaragua? And will the agreement make it easier for Nicaragua to develop specific industries and sectors? And what does Nicaragua expect to import from China that will make life better for Nicaraguans? And I hope the, the Hector Garza and Carlos Ron could answer that a little in the relation to their countries. Okay, Mr. Bermudez. Thanks so much. First of all, I think we should take into consideration that the relationship with China is one of cooperation. It's a relationship of fair trade, a relationship in which China shares its knowledge and its development with Nicaragua. That's the starting point of the free trade agreement that we're negotiating. It's quite broad. It contemplates cooperation in all sectors. That's the first point. Secondly, we believe that it is important for Nicaragua to find new paths so that in the medium and long term, we can put an end to our excessive dependence on the United States. The United States is constantly threatening us with sanctions, even in the area of trade, although they have not yet been able to implement the trade sanctions except in the area of, of sugar. So we see that this free trade agreement with China that uh, will allow Nicaragua to practically double the number of consumers that we can reach because at present we're allowed to lead to 1,500 consumers with a pre preferential treatment. Uh, and but hopefully with the demand to agricultural products produced by Nicaragua, with selling this in China, we'll be able to increase our production. We believe that demand will further stimulate growth in our production. Our production has been growing over the past few years between 10 and 12%. 
Our, that is our agricultural production, and we believe that this free uh, trade agreement will incentivize it to grow even more. And we also expect to increase the productivity of our agricultural sector. And there are two major fields in which we believe that the trade agreement with China will be extremely important, and that is in investments. Which sector are we thinking that could be important in terms of Chinese investment? This could be production, primarily primarily industry and agro-industry. We already produce, uh, produce our agricultural products very competitively, and we need to agro-industrialize what we are producing. The other sectors we believe could be important to develop is tourism, the financial sector will be extremely important, particularly in light of the sanctions that we're talking about in this webinar, and construction. We believe that these sectors are going to be there trying to develop with Chinese cooperation. Now, what do we want to import from China? At present, Nicaragua imports approximately 53% of everything that Nicaragua imports is raw material, uh, inputs, capital goods, and consumer goods that we don't produce. We import this from the United States, from the European Union. Our idea is for China to become the main source of these products. China produces everything that we import. We import approximately six billion dollars. We are thinking that we could import six to five to six billion uh, in products uh, on an annual basis. We're already importing from China 1.5 billion. So that is the vision we have of the Chinese relationship. We see them as a an older brother because China has a philosophy of sharing, not taking, but rather sharing its benefits, its development with our country. And for us, that is extremely important. And we're now seeing this with the cooperation that is developing in different fields. So I believe that this could be the answer to the question related to the free trade agreement with China. Thank you. Okay, would uh, Carlos Ron, would you like to answer that question in relation to China, in relation to uh, Venezuela? So we have a, a, a very strong relationship with, with China right now. I think it's probably the safe to say that it is the best moment in the relation of the two countries' uh, history. Uh, China has been, uh, you know, a strong partner we you know we have probably over 500 uh agreements with china in in different areas and, and like uh, the minister said before the, the way china approaches uh exchanges uh, is is a model where there is mutual gain everything is done in a way that uh you know we try to uh obtain uh benefits for for both countries and without the um request or, or, or um, demand uh, by China that we change our internal policies or that we change uh, who we speak to or that you know we, 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 we change the way we carry out uh, our policies with regards to other countries or with regards to uh, our internal politics. Uh, China doesn't ask of that. Uh, uh, and this is something that that is very important uh, for for people to to understand. That's why I think the 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 benefits of of this relationship uh, are 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 big and, and important. Um, you know, uh, as a few months ago, for example, it was announced that Venezuela was invited by China to take part in to in uh, their space uh, um, development projects. And this is very important for us because it's it, it's a exchange where you know we are going to increase our um, our knowledge and 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 it's something that benefits our our science and technology uh, development. So this is just I just give you this as an example of things that we're doing with China, uh, and and I think that this relationship in particular, again, a relationship of mutual gains. It's important for us 
and for the rest of the region. I think uh, the way China has approached Venezuela, I believe, uh, in, by, because of what Minister Bermudez has said and, and other cases that, that I've heard of, is, is of a respectful approach. It's a, an approach that, that seeks uh, cooperation rather than imposition and, and exploitation. And I think it's a, it's a very uh, important change in the traditional ways in which our countries carried out um, exchanges with, with um, larger countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Minister. Um, Ambassador uh, Hector Igarza, would you like to answer the question about the Cuba's relations with China or the trade relations, economic and trade relations in China, and uh, what are the focus of the trade relations? Yes, uh, in the case of Cuba, we and uh, well, there is a history of very good relationship with uh, between Cuba and China. And if we talk about the, the, the Chinese in Cuba, we have to say that uh, the first Chinese who came to Cuba was in 19th century, even before the independence of, of, of Cuba. And since then, there has been a very big colony of uh, Chinese in Cuba until today, as most of the countries have, we too will to have uh, Chinatown in, in, in Havana. But uh, as you know, the, the Cuban uh, government triumphed in 1959, and the year, uh, one year later, it uh, recognized the People's Republic of China as uh, an independent as a country. Um, and uh, since then, our, our bilateral relations has been increasing, increasing. So far that today we can say that China is the, the, the second country in exchange in uh, terms of trade of, uh, with Cuba. It's the second, the number two um, partner in our uh, economy. Our relations are based on trade, credit, and investments that have increased since the last uh, 30 years, especially after the fall of the rest of the socialist uh, world from Europe. It has been uh, increasing. And today we have to say that uh, uh, China for us uh, means a lot for our economy. They are present in our cooperation, in, our tra in the trade, and uh, especially in the, the field of food, production of food, and in our priority which is, is uh, our goal to have at least more than 24, 24 25% of uh, our electricity coming from uh, clean sources. So China is working with us, is in, in investing with us in the production of clean uh, electricity, which is uh, something we are in need, especially after the sanction of the United States have uh, hit our economy, especially in the, uh, in the import of oil. As you know, Cuba, uh, the uh, production of electricity in Cuba is uh, used mainly with uh, oil. So China uh, for us means a, a lot in terms of trade, in terms of uh, commerce. We have uh, a lot of students, uh, Chinese students in, in Cuba. We have uh, Cuban studying in, in China, and uh, we are one of the very closest uh, uh, partner of China in the Bird and Road Initiative for, for Trade. China is not only important for Cuba, China is important for most of the, of the countries around the world. The position of China in, in the BRICS, which is the platform that include Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa together with China has called the attention of the rest of the world. And today we have to say that there are a lot of countries that are looking you know, for being members of that uh, platform, which is uh, a, a goal that uh, I think will increase the interest of uh, many other countries. And the, the weight of China in the international uh, a scenario is what, uh, in my opinion, is provoking this xenophobia that 
is existing in the American media, in the American government. Now, the Secretary of State of the United States is in China. China accepted this visit, but after four months of postponement, in order to say to the United States that China is an independent country, China is not afraid of talking to the United States because China is very well imposed in the rest of the world in the international community. So we have to say that China is today a big brother, not only for Cuba, but for third world in general. As you know, Cuba is the chairman of the group of 77 plus China. And in September this year, we are going to organize in Havana a summit of the head of state and government and China will be uh, represented in order to increase, in order to strengthen the relationship between China and the third world. So saying that, I have to say, to repeat that for us, China is a model of country in the cooperation field, is a model of, of, uh, of a country, of, of a power or a superpower making business with poor people, with people from the third world. Thank you. Thank you to all three of these speakers for uh, their answers to that question, that very interesting question. We have another similar question now, uh, and I'd like to pose it to all three of the speakers as well. Um, regarding the recent visit of, of Iran to your countries, could you comment on the relationship of your country with Iran? Who is it starting? I uh, go right ahead, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Myself, well, uh, I will remember that uh, when Iran started to to talk about uh, uh, increasing relations with our three countries, it was not very well received for from the uh, United States. But one question is uh, real, is that uh, although there are some level of relationship between Iran and each of our countries, we have to say that bilateral relations between Iran and Cuba are very good. And it does not, it does not uh, are based on only because we have a common enemy, because we have an enemy who is uh, sanctioning our two countries, that we have an enemy that wants to change our government, but that we have an enemy that is looking to support, to finance the so-called opposition. And in many times, in many points, trying to build up an opposition that does not exist. I mean, it is not only because we have this common enemy, but because we have a very good cooperation in terms of trade, especially in the, in the field of biotechnology and pharmaceutical uh, uh, cooperation. For example, we have been uh, producing the, some of the Cuban vaccines that we have exported to Iran. And now we have signed an agreement with Iran in order to produce our vaccines for COVID-19 in Iran in a joint venture. So this is a, a, an example of the cooperation we have with Iran. The recent, this week, visit of, of the president of Iran was to increase, to strengthen our cooperation, our trade, and our fraternal uh, uh, relationship. We insisted, we reaffirmed our commitment to keep working on the field of bi biotechnology, the, uh, pharmaceutical uh, production, and exchange of tourism. I think that we have a very uh, good moment now in the, in the uh, cooperation. Energy is 
one of the fields that uh, Iran could uh, come to uh, help uh, to help uh, our our country, our situation. I'm sure that the future of this situation is very brilliant. I hope I hope that this cooperation uh, will have a successful result, not only for us but for the rest of our countries that are under the sanction of the United States. I'm talking about Venezuela and our dear uh, friend, uh, Nicaragua. Thank you. Would the other two speakers also like to respond to the question? Whoever would like to go first. Well, I would say that uh, it is, uh, you know, the the, the relationship between Venezuela and Iran is an important relationship uh, that also uh, comes from way back. Uh, Iran is part of OPEC and it's an organization of oil producers uh, that together with Venezuela and other countries as well uh, developed uh, in the 60s. So that, that's uh, as far as, as back as, as our relationship stand. Uh, and today, you know, uh, in this recent visit, uh, we have re we had recently signed uh, a comprehensive agreement uh, strategy for 20 years with Iran in, in a whole series of different uh, types of uh, areas, including uh, energy, of course, including uh, um, uh, tourism, including uh, agriculture, and there's a lot to learn from each other. I, I subscribe what uh, the ambassador has said because I think it's, it's pretty much the same spirit of the relationship uh, with Venezuela, is that it is important that countries, uh, you know, can, can really come together and strengthen areas uh, of cooperation, uh, and that this should not be uh, also in, read or interpreted as uh, an attack or, or, or some sort of response to the United States. We do this because we have uh, common interests and we have things that we, you know, that we want to develop together. And, and I think it is important uh, that the people of the United States understand that this is a right that sovereign countries have to have commerce, trade and exchanges with other countries and that when, when these come about, they're not in response to what you know, the United States uh, does or, or wants or fears. Uh, and I say this because in media, and I think this is an important point, in the media is, is usually the, the you know, when, even when we, uh, you know, Cuba, Nicaragua and Venezuela have relations, that is also criticized uh, by this, uh, uh, this media attempt uh, to to place everything we do as something against the United States, when in reality we are all looking for the benefit of our peoples. What what the what the people of the United States should know is that when when we are working towards cooperation with other countries, we do in a, with a sense that this is something that will benefit our population's development, and not as a way to you know, provoke or, 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 you know, discuss any, any, uh, anybody else uh, throughout the world. Cooperation with, with, with other countries from outside our region has given us a lot of strength. Uh, I think it has proven, like the ambassador said uh, before, it has proven that, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that can, can benefit each other. In the case of Venezuela in particular, in, in, in the more recent times, the, the knowledge and scientific development that Iran has developed over the years of, of blockade in its uh, oil sector has helped them, uh, have, has put them in a position where they can help us as well uh, to uh, repair our, our oil sector, uh, improve, uh, uh, you know, th those, services and, and those maintenance that, that, that we can't have because of the sanctions. So the cooperation in that area has really been uh, helpful 
to revitalize and, and recuperate our, our oil sector that was uh, hurt by uh, the unilateral sanctions. Thank you. Mr. Bermudez, uh, do you have a response also about the relationship of Nicaragua with Iran? Okay. Yes, and, uh, yes, along the and, same lines. Han dicho los compañeros de Venezuela y Cuba, pues As, la relación con Irán es una relación de cooperación. Compañeros ya from Venezuela and Cuba said de Nicaragua has a relationship of cooperation with Iran. We have an economic, trade, science, and technology uh, relationship. We have just formed a mixed committee that would allow us to explore various areas of cooperation. Nosotros necesitamos and, esa cooperación uh, en salud. Uh, en otros campos que uh, Iran is very son strong in education and health. They're very Irán strong. So I think that the relationship eh, with este Iran is a very important ¿verdad? one in a world of sanctions. Y pues They've also suffered bastante, from sanctions like eh, us. Que so para que esa we have to be very creative to ensure países, that this cooperation can be positive for both countries in terms of their development. El, I think that el, is the el, most el important político, thing. Setting aside all political matters, I believe that the cooperation between Iran and our countries is extremely important for future development. Thank you. Okay, I can ask the uh, next question, which uh, comes from Kathy Hoyt, which is um, for each of the speakers. What further role can international solidarity play in working to end U.S. sanctions? And I should note that uh, we were going to have this webinar next Sunday, but since next Sunday, there's a national demonstration in Washington, D.C. against the U.S. blockade of Cuba and putting Cuba on this uh, bogus terrorism list, uh, we changed it to today. So that is uh, one event I'd like to mention that is coming up that we can participate in for helping uh, build solidarity with these countries. But if you would like, three like to answer what further roles we can do to in the United States to help the U.S. sanctions on your countries. We could start with uh, Carlos Romney, if you'd like. Yes, thank you, Stan. Um, well, I think I think solidarity is fundamental uh, because I think there's a lot of uh, people in the United States. I would say the majority of people of the United States. Do not agree with these policies against our countries and with these blockades, these aggressions. I think uh, a lot of people simply don't, don't know uh, how to react or how to do uh, uh, something different uh, from this policy. So I think it is important that uh, through these efforts, such as this uh, webinar, which we are very thankful uh, for, with, with, from you know, with, with all the organizers for for having for allowing us to speak and to tell more of our story. I think th those are key so that people know what's going on, so that people know what the policies imply to, to our countries, so that people also find uh, ways to reject that. Because again, I know most people are are not in agreement uh, with the fact that their government is promoting you know, criminal actions against independent governments elsewhere. I think solidarity is, is key to raise consciousness. Our, the blockade, it's not only against us, but it's also against the people of the United States because they're being blockaded from the information, uh, from knowing what our, our countries are really about, what our, our socialist programs are really about, programs are really about, from knowing even that, you know, our approach to the people of the United States is one of you know, brotherhood and, 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 and also solidarity. See, when, when measures were taken, for example, against CITGO, which is a Venezuelan owned uh, oil company that in the United States, but it's owned by Venezuela. Uh, when measures were taken against CITGO, CITGO stopped financing a lot of social programs in, in the United States. You know, you had the heating oil program that was mentioned before that, that, that uh, you know, helped uh, low-income communities uh, have access to that uh, 
uh, and but there were also another set of uh, of, of programs that were important uh, um, urban farming programs and and other pro social programs that were that were helping people in the US and that had been put in, into place because there was the consciousness uh, in Venezuela that you know we had to help uh, social programs in the, in the US that would benefit the people. So see, that is blocked. That information is blocked for the majority of, of the people in the US. No media outlet covers that. So the, the importance of solidarity is that solidarity has to overcome that blockade. Uh, by by providing information, by but you know by finding ways to tell the truth about the way you know we approach uh, the relationship with the United States and with, particularly with the people of the United States. I think solidarity is also uh, important in cases like the one of uh, Alex Saab, which is a Venezuelan diplomat who you know has been uh, put into prison in the United States. He has it's been three years now since he was was illegally kidnapped in Cabo Verde and then you know brought to the United States about a year and a half ago and you know he is there uh, because he had he was on a special mission uh, from Venezuela to try to obtain uh, medicine medical supplies gasoline like a, a whole series of, 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 of things that we needed during the pandemic and because he was being successful at it and because he was a key player in doing these things the United States disregarded his diplomatic immunity and has placed him into jail. And it's important that solidarity, uh, uh, you know, has has made uh, people become more aware of this case of this uh, violation of international law, his human rights. And this is the type of, of thing that I think uh, solidarity can achieve: raise consciousness in the United States, as they did, for example, in the case of the Cub uh, Cuban uh, heroes, the five Cuban heroes. It was very important. Uh, that that took place. It was very important uh, when Solidarity in the United States denounced the Contra during the uh, uh, Nicaragua uh, Sandinista Revolution. It was very important that you know Solidarity uh, brought out you know th this idea that you know the the government was uh, committing crimes there as well. Solidarity has a key role. It, it, it's the role of bringing truth to the conversation. It's the role of pointing out. Uh, when we need to, when, when we can't, because we are blocked and, and, and you are blocked as well from the information and from knowing what the reality in our countries are. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlos Ron. Um, this, Jesus Bermudez didn't answer yet, right? Um, before we, I turn to him, I would also like to mention that there is Code Pink is having organizing a tour to Venezuela in August. I don't know if they still have room available if people want to go on it. And then the Venezuela and Alba Weekly news that I do for Alliance for Global Justice, I put a listing of all the different tours that people can go on to Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba, uh, which it's good for people to publicize them so people get to learn about these countries and not to get to see for themselves what's going on. So, um, Stan, how would somebody subscribe to your uh, Alba Solidarity newsletter? They would have to write to Alliance, go to afgj.org and they can subscribe. And also, they can subscribe to Nika Notes there also. Um, so, um, Jesus Bermudez, would you like to uh, answer the question, mm -hmm. the issue about uh, in international solidarity with your country and how to help build it here? Sí. Yes, gracias. thank you very much. I think that there is a whole media campaign, a huge one, that distorts the reality of our countries. I believe that the main contribution of solidarity precisely could be to reveal facts about the reality of our countries. 
Who in the United States knows that Nicaragua devotes more than 56 percent of its general budget of the Republic for social programs? Who knows about that in the U.S.? Who know, Who in the U.S. knows that here in Nicaragua, education and health care are free of charge? completely free. Who knows that our government has doubled the number of paid, paved roads in, in Nicaragua since coming into office, or that Nicaragua has dropped its poverty level to 24% when before Daniel Ortega came back into office, it was 48%. Who knows all of these figures? I think that it's very important to discuss all of this information. And this is how solidarity can help our countries to make sure that the people in the United States know the truth. I've spoken with friends in the United States who have never gone to Nicaragua and come here and said, this is so different from what we hear in our news or what we see on CNN in the United States. This is totally different. This is what they say after they speak to farmers, to peasants, and they say that things are, life is good for them there because Nicaragua is growing and continues to grow and will continue to grow. And this is thanks to our programs and policies, the policies of this government led by Comandante Daniel Ortega and Compañera Rosario Murillo. So I think that that's where solidarity with Nicaragua should focus, which is to tell people the truth about Nicaragua, what you don't hear in the United States, that very few people are aware of in the United States. I think that is the biggest contribution that solidarity could make. Thank you very much. So this is my turn now. Yes. <laughs> Thank you again. Well, in the case of Cuba, uh, you know, we consider that it's time, it's time to consider the solidarity as a sentiment that be that should be globalized. We are always saying that solidarity is an avenue of two ways. You give it and you take it. And in our experience, we have been offering our solidarity with the resources we have since the triumph of the revolution. And even before our revolutionary uh, movement, before the revolution, used to be very, very kind of being with, for example, during the, the war in Spain, our people sent volunteers to work, to, to, to fight. Uh, I'm really a long time. The Cuban, sorry? Okay, to, 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 to fight together with the, the Spanish uh, people. Uh, and uh, after the revolution, since the triumph of the revolution, we have been sending our people, especially uh, doctors and nurses, wherever it is needed. When President, former President Bush said that he was going to send soldiers to all corners of the world. Our Commander-in-Chief Fidel Castro said, we are going to send our doctors to all corners of the world. And by saying that, we remember that our first uh, medical brigade that was sent to a third country was in Algeria in May 1963. Since then, we have been sending our doctors and nurses to more than 65, around 65 countries around the world. And uh, not only doctors and nurses, we have been sending our people, uh, advisors of agriculture, advisors of, of the culture, about advisors in the, in the education uh, field. And we say that uh, when you give solidarity, you receive it. So we are very, very, uh, happy to say that uh, we do not give what it last. We do give what uh, we have. And even in these uh, difficult circumstances that we are facing now because of the sanctions of the United States, we have been able to uh, offer our uh, solidarity with uh, some uh, countries like uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua, um, Mexico, Syria, Western Sahara, we have sent our vaccines to those uh, people who are in need in Nicaragua. So it's uh, to say that uh, uh, 
now that we have been uh, in this uh, period of uh, difficulties, we have been receiving as well the solidarity from Nicaragua, from uh, Venezuela, and not only from them, but uh, with, from, from China, from Russia, so some uh, movement of uh, solidarity in the United States, in, uh, uh, in Europe, and from Asia, even from Africa, we have been receiving some, some aid. So uh, solidarity is what we have. Solidarity is what we're looking for in these turbulent times. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. And I want to say that it's been a while since I visited your wonderful country, but it's a great place. And Thank your you. image of comparing sending soldiers all around the world and doctors all ar around the world is very inspiring. Uh, the United States should be following more Cuba's example in that. Uh, I also want to say uh, to Minister Jesus Bermudez, Bermudez uh, that uh, I have visited Nicaragua many times, and I urge everyone to visit Nicaragua because it is inspiring and people are not getting the message uh, in the mainstream media. You need to go and see Nicaragua for yourself. Uh, we are going to take um, advantage of the fact that we, we have these uh, wonderful speakers with us to ask one more question before uh, ending this session. And this comes then from Mark Ginsburg. Could the speakers please discuss how education in each country has been positively affected by the ALBA TCP and how it has been negatively affected by the unilateral coercive measures imposed by the United States? Um, Minister Bermudez, would you like to start? Yes, of course. Talking about education is one of the main benefits for, for our own people. Here is free, totally free. And all the resources that we get in our country uh, based on the solidarity model comes to the social programs. And education is part of the social programs. And whenever we see an interruption or a uh, an impact on the social programs. Obviously, education is one of those programs that have been negatively affected. In fact, those sanctions have impacted the education programs in the country, definitely. Nevertheless, as I was saying, our current government continues making huge efforts. So, for the programs not to be affected. Our capacity of building new schools and welcome even more students have increased during the last years. Not only in education, we have been increasing the programs on health. During the neoliberal governments, they were building two hospitals every 10 years. We are building two hospitals every year. That's what happened in, in Nicaragua. These are the different efforts that we make e even beyond the sanctions that we see. And we will continue growing hand in hand with the solidarity we get from different countries. Thanks so much. Yeah, Carlos Ron. Uh, yes, with, with regards to education, like we said before, uh, you know, this is part of the um, benefits uh, that we have had uh, under ALBA. There's different types of exchanges. Uh, well, first, at all levels, first, you know, literacy, like we said before, was overcome, but then there's also been other types of exchanges with our partner uh, ALBA countries in, in, uh, in, in medicine and, and, and other types of uh, of areas where there have been student exchanges that have been very important. Now, the, the, the way in which the unilateral sanctions keep uh, attacking or affecting this, uh, you know, this area in particular, since it was you know, a success of the revolution, Venezuela, for example, we, we had the largest uh, you know, 
we have one of the largest uh, university enrollments in the region uh, in Cuba as well. Uh, so, so you know, one of the the, the aspects of of the sanctions was precisely to attack uh, education, uh, to to attack the, the possibility that we can uh, improve, uh, you know, uh, import things that that will be helpful in improving education, but also, um, you know, but the public sector as as the public sector is dependent on the income from uh, in the case of Minnesota from from uh, the state and, and that being income from oil revenues. Uh, once uh, blockade starts, then it, it has it has been a problem for us to to you know to raise salaries in specific, in areas uh, dependent on the public sector. That has been one of the large effects of the sanctions. While you know some some parts of the private sector are you know have have been. Uh, improving uh, be, because they're not subjected to the same sanctions as the as uh, Venezuela's public sector is you know the public sector is dragging behind the sanctions are making it, are dragging it behind and salaries for example of, of uh, teachers professors are not at the level that they should be right now because of, of the lack of revenue and and and, and not, not only for, for, for of course of, of for the educators but also in along all public sector employees so this is a direct effect you know the, the, this is this is an effect that you know that that hurt, help, help hurts uh, you know our capability of providing better services in general to, to the public from the state because the state's uh, incomes are caught off by uh, these sanctions but you know, the 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 government has uh, applied uh, uh, mechanisms to try to revert this and to try to combat this. We have an anti-blockade law that was put into effect uh, a couple of years ago, and and it has it, it, it contemplates uh, special projects, and the, from those projects, uh, the funding comes back to the state, and, and specifically to those areas that have been hit, have been hurt most. So that the priorities of the Bolivarian uh, Revolution, which has always been the social uh, component of, of our government, again, providing healthcare, education, uh, housing, so that these things are kept as priority every time income comes from uh, any of these new projects under the anti-blockade law and overall. So we're fighting this, but it, it surely has been uh, uh, you know, an attack on on these uh, on this area of education. Again, the purpose of sanctions is hurting people. The purpose of sanction is hurting the country and hurting the capability of the country uh, to provide uh, for the people. Because the idea is that they would make people suffer enough so that they would turn against its own government. So that's why I think. Uh, it is important that, that that we that we keep this in mind. All the social programs are always going to be under attack by sanctions. Um, until we get rid of those sanctions, uh, we we'll always have to be finding creative ways and creative solutions so that we don't uh, we maintain uh, the focus of our uh, policies, which is to provide a dignified living for our people. Thank you. Ambassador Igarza? Yes. Well, uh, as you know, education for us has been uh, one of the priorities uh, since the triumph of the revolution. As you can uh, remember, in 1961, the revolution has decided that from that year on, uh, everybody in Cuba had to learn how to write and, and, and read. And that was a very successful campaign that allowed our people to be educated. Uh, our people is uh, not only educated in terms of universities, in terms of high school, it's educated in all sectors of the, of the, of the life. I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about technology, I'm talking about health. For the Cuban government, education is one of the priorities, even today around 72% of our uh, annual budget is dedicated 
to education, health, and social security, 72%. This is a figure that not all countries in the world can uh, present as we can do it in a very happily way to, to say that we are dedicating most of our budget to the well-being of, uh, of the people. Of course, the education has been one of the fields that has been affected as all fields of the life in Cuba because of the uh, United States uh, sanctions. Let's say, for example, that uh, in our report to the United Nations on June 23rd uh, in, in 2021, we said, we informed that uh, from April 2019 to March 2020, before, even before the, the health emergency that was declared because of the pandemic, the blockade impact only in the education sector reached $21 million. This is for a small country like ours, it's very, very damaging. And if we want to talk about the accumulated damages of the six decade blockade, we have to say that we are now around 150 billion since the, the, the beginning of this policy of sanctions. It means that we are uh, losing every year because of this uh, punitive uh, policy around 5 billion, 5 billion every year. This is too much. And that's why we say this uh, policy of sanction has to end because it's affecting the people. It's not affecting any government. The, the, the sanctions do not, do, do not affect the government of Venezuela, the government of uh, Nicaragua, the government of Cuba. The main victims, the main victims of these sanctions are the people. Those people, they say they want to help, they want to send aid. This is what the Americans say, they, they, what Biden say that he's repeating what all American presidents have been saying that they are wanted to help the Cuban people. This is a big lie. They are not helping the people. They are threatening the existence of the people. And all these sanctions are as a goal to provoke a sentiment of, in the people that it's their governments that are guilty, that are the responsible for the situation. And that's why they, they, they spend a lot of millions, billions every year in propaganda, in, in, the, in the supporting the media against our three countries. And we will keep sending our doctors, we will keep sending our teachers wherever it, it is needed, because solidarity in the in the in the uh, social sector is important. It is not it is not a coincidence that the United States is looking always to keep people in the ignorance, because once the people know how to read and write, he will learn wh where is the truth. It uh, will help people to think. The ignorance is the people is, is what the Americans want to keep people in the ignorance to repeat what they say. But when a people learn, uh, is educated by in itself, by himself, so the situation changed and he will know the reality, which is not exactly what the American government is wanting for uh, our people. Yes, our people is affected. Our education system is affected in all levels. Uh, we are affected by the technological advances. We are affected by the computers uh, industry that uh, we are affected in all sectors in the life of education, but with our resources, we will overcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, at this point, uh, we need to draw this webinar to a close, but we are very grateful to the speakers, to the interpreters, to uh, Yoav, our tech person, and most of all, to the people who have been interested enough to participate in the audience of this webinar. And thank you for staying on, everyone, uh, past the, the time originally allotted, but I think it was worth it.
Thank you so much. Stan, do you have any last comments? Okay. Well, then we'll say goodbye for now. But again, thank you, everyone. Thank you.